I'm super passionate about sharing science and technology as it relates to cannabis. And I've always had a question, which is, can you convey information within a minute? Well, in today's episode or video, I'm going to show you 16 cannabis technology tips and highlights. And I've taken these specifically from a weekly show that comes out on YouTube every Tuesday, highlighting lifestyle, news, technology. And in this clip, you're seeing technology about a minute per clip, and you're going to learn a lot if you stay till the end. I hope you enjoy it. Hi team, thank you for having me on today. So we're going to start off discussing uh, a bit unusual story from Bioharvest Sciences. Um, this is a company that's making use of bioreactors, photobioreactors, where they're actually taking clones from plant material, uh, so the best genetics they can find. And what they do is they've modified this in a non-GMO GMO manner, so not genetically modified, to grow in suspension. And then what happens is that actually they grow these bioreactors and they start to precipitate onto a scaffolding the actual trichomes. So instead of the trichomes being on the leaves of the plant, they start to precipitate in the actual solution and then they harvest these trichomes to then produce what would be considered in their view a more medicinally controlled product without genetically modifying the organisms used for that cloning. So it's a bit of a bizarre one, but it is interesting just primarily from a new approach to actual manufacturing of uh, trichomes and specific cannabinoids. Uh, naturally, we'd hope there is no genetic modification of these types of activities in the future, but you can only trust the biofarm industry to make changes. We're going to talk about commercialization and actually getting the structure in place to allow for trade. We need to talk about some quality aspects around the actual goods being on shelves. And this is where we're going to talk maybe on a stability chamber. Now, this is something that's often used when we're trying to determine the shelf life of a product and how long we actually have it for. So what happens is these cabinets are set at predetermined uh, humidity and temperature. And because there's different climatic zones in the world, your cannabis is stored in maybe two or three of these cabinets. And then based on how it does, we actually know how the terpenes will degradate or not over a period of time and how maybe even the cannabinoids would degradate. And based on that, we can give better label claims to products, not only locally, but also internationally. Hi everyone. So today we're going to be talking about analytical equipment for testing, specifically an HPLC. So what is an HPLC? It's essentially a high pressure or high performance liquid chromatography system. Now, what, is, what do you use this for ultimately in the lab? Well, first thing you're going to do is you're going to actually prepare your sample. So whether that's a high THC flower or a CBD flower or even an extract. And what you'll do is you'll load this preparative sample into the HPLC, dissolve into a solvent. And using that, you'll be able to actually see what is called the chromatogram. And if we have a picture of it on the screen, you'll see they have these little peaks and bumps where essentially you can tell how much CBD, how much THC is in there, just on the volume. So this requires some integration, but the volume underneath that curve tells you exactly how much quantity there is, provided you've made a reference standard to compare that to, and you've got a validated method. And because of this, you're allowed to you know, do a array of tests. And it's also nice because you can even use it for things like cleaning validation. So a preparative surface that you use, you can then clean, prove that it's clean and there's no contaminants by using something like HPLC. So in today's Canatech, what we're going to be talking about is SBD or short path distillation. Essentially what this is, is you take an oil that's been already initially extracted as a crude. Uh, if it's been winterized and prepared, you load it into a boiling flask in a heating mantle, and this will vaporize and go up the column and then process over a condenser. Now you can either do hot or cold condensing, depending on what you're trying to achieve with the actual fractional distillation. But essentially what you're doing is you're breaking up the oil into different fractions where you get rid of impurities and ultimately enrich the sample to get to that higher 90, 95% type of purity. Additionally, you can follow this up by doing some form of chromatography or taking it to like a liquid, 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 liquid extraction for the process. And that gives you a better idea about a Canatech. Hi guys, excellent. So we're gonna shift it up for Canatech and we're gonna talk not about flour like Noxie did, but specifically on extracts. And the extracts we're gonna talk about is Delta-8. Now, what is Delta-8? Um, essentially, it's an isomer, so very similar to Delta-9. It's just a shift in a double bond on the actual product. So how are these products manufactured? Well, in the US, it's legal to obviously harvest CBD uh, in bulk. And what happens is they actually convert CBD into a product called Delta-8. And that Delta-8 is not as uh, psychotropic as Delta-9 in terms of its effects, but when you're testing for Delta-9 in certain states where it's illicit, Delta-8 obviously flies under the radar, and that's why it's particularly proper or popular in certain areas. So the only thing to watch out for with a Delta-8 product is 
making sure that it doesn't have any kind of chemical synthesis post-reaction cleanups. So the quality of a Delta-8 product is really important to make sure that you don't get any unwanted chemicals with that conversion from CBD. And it just goes to show, again, just open up the access to responsible Delta-9 products because people are always going to be producing Delta-8s or HHC products or any related synthetic products from something like CBD. Now so in today's Canatech, we're going to be talking about what is a supercritical CO2 extractor. So let's address the first one, CO2, carbon dioxide. It's what anyone would breathe out except when it's purified and that's the only gas that we're using this is what's used as a solvent to extract from cannabis biomass to produce extracts now there's different ways you can use co2 under pressure and time to essentially get to your product of interest so really what happens is you're pressurizing a vessel where biomass is loaded and in the initial stage what you'll do is in a subcritical run which is essentially stripping the terpenes the terpenes the smells we love from cannabis is put as a separate fraction then you increase the pressure on that extraction and you get to what is called the supercritical state now i'm not going to get into the chemistry behind it but essentially what it does at that state is it strips the cannabinoids that you really want from the biomass that can then be taken as a fraction and further prepared separated winterized to produce an oil that you want to have along with your actual terpenes that you extracted earlier to produce a full spectrum as much full spectrum as possible you know how does one go about testing for heavy metals we often hear that uh, cannabis is an aggregated plant which means it takes on metals quite easily and in a country where there's a history of a lot of open mining uh, it is a point of concern because uh, the, the negative side effects of long-term metal exposure especially heavy metals is concerning so this is usually achieved via two routes either you make use of a AA, an atomic absorption device or you use something like an icp which stands for inductively coupled plasma so essentially what would happen is this device would have an ignition source they generate ions when they heat the sample and from the spectra they would basically know using either an oes or a mass spec on the back end of that instrument whether or not there's a lot of heavy metals in that product or in that sample uh, for the most part it's easy to implement cultivation practices that avoids the introduction of heavy metals however just to protect human health it is good to know what is in your sample uh, especially once it starts to get into consumers hands and medical patients hands talking about hhc which is hexahydrocannabinol which is essentially a completely hydrogenated version of delta 9 essentially similar to how you convert vegetable oil into margarine so really stabilizing out the molecule the reason it exists is obviously to avoid drug testing uh, and similar of other different uh, delta 8s and thcos uh, but it, again the chemistry behind it is what makes it tricky and a bit of a concerning product for consumer consumption awesome so today we're going to talk about what is a quantum sensor or essentially a par sensor um, this is essentially a device that's used often usually more indoor than outdoor to assess the intensity of the uh, photons that are striking the canopy. So essentially, in addition to measuring intensity, it measures the spectrum itself. So ideally you get one of a fuller range that ranges from 400 nanometers up to 700 nanometers. And this will be able to tell you and you'll be able to adjust your lights so that you can hit maximum intensity for the stage of where you are in the grow on the canopy itself. Um, so that's what a quantum sensor is. It's very useful to have to assess the output from your lights. So for everyone who's obviously been tracking cannabinoids, you'll be familiar with uh, when we refer to cannabinoids are uh, typically phytocannabinoids. And uh, those that study the body and biochemistry will also know about endocannabinoids, which are essentially an andamide and 2-AG that are in the body. But the aspect that's really interesting is how synthetic cannabinoids came into play. And, and this is from a range of different products where they've named off the actual authors. So HU synthetics are usually from the uni university, the Hebrew University. Uh, so Raphael Moshulam, um, things like JWH is uh, John Hoffman. And basically the point of these synthetic cannabinoids initially was to enable research when there wasn't a lot of allowance for research into cannabinoids. And, and since it's been commercialized in terms of synthetics, uh, being uh, dronabinol and the rest, we've seen illicit products start to enter the market. And these illicit cannabinoids is really what is quite scary because they are analogs for THC and they bind often more effectively to the CB1 receptor in the body, causing a longer or more strong sustained high or at a lower dose. And by manipulating these half-lives of these molecules, you can actually start to change the, the way a cannabinoid would be experienced. Not that we can always call them cannabinoids, but because they act on the CB1 receptor, they're often classified as synthetic cannabinoids. 
So have you ever wondered, you know, whether one gummy has got the same amount of THC or CBD as the other? Well, a lot of this comes down to the actual preparation of these extracts and then how they dissolve into solution. Now, to facilitate this, we make use of equipment called homogenizers as well as sonicators. And essentially what this does is it's a probe that gets inserted into a beaker and it, it homogenizes and it sends a, a frequency through the solution, which allows it to be evenly distributed in the mix. So that's specifically a homogenizer that breaks it up and makes it even, whether that's a topical or jelly or anything of that sort. And then the sonicators actually go and create a frequency where they form these little tiny droplets, uh, either micelles or liposomes, if you add in some additional things to it. And this allows you to then allow to take a product that's more bioavailable. Great, so today we're going to talk about genetic profiling, essentially looking at the genome of a cannabis plant, you know, sequencing the individual nucleotides of the plant to understand exactly what makes the plant specifically effective and how to potentially protect breeders in the future. So one project that is of interest is called the Thousand Cannabis Genome Project. Uh, essentially what they've done in this project is they've gone and identified and sequenced up to 850 strains of cannabis. And the hope obviously is that as, they, as science evolves around the plant, we'll better understand exactly which genes express which uh, terpenes, which cannabinoids. In addition, we'll also be able to hopefully end the debate one day between what is a, you know, a hybrid between more leaning towards sativa or indica, because if it has a genotype that's genetically marked, you can pretty much say what kind of split we're looking at. Uh, and then why, does, why do we care about it? I mean, I think it also helps cultivars understand with that specific genetic what kind of epigenetic effects from the environment is going to drive, for instance, you know, THC production or avoid THC production if you're looking for a hemp varietal. So it's going to be an interesting space to see what happens as more sequencing data comes out on cannabis plants and we better understand the science behind the process. Now, can cultivation uh, a lot of companies are looking to scale and scale more cannabis production and this is where tissue culture or micropropagation comes in essentially it's the process of actually you know taking the plant material sterilizing it and also growing it on the culture so essentially making use of agar which is traditionally red algae or seaweed where you sterilize this component you add the uh, the node sites in there and you cultivate it and the one benefit of this is it allows for massive consistency in terms of the kinds of plants you're going to grow out it also makes it quite easy for you to ship cannabis around the world so you know grain it in these little petri dishes send it around the world whether you agree or disagree with it it does give good consistency to the actual type of uh, cannabis flowers that are being grown out and then essentially they would just be replanted at the facility that's required and this is more something we see in the commercial side of cannabis production and um, there's some good cannabis clone cultivators in the country of south africa that are doing a lot of good work and have exported to multiple designations so in terms of today's session uh, there's been a lot of talk for the last few years on personalized medicine specifically looking at the person's genome so since the human uh, genome project uh, in the early 2000s and identifying certain genes within an organism where there might be an issue in this case uh, in, uh, there's a company called uh, endocana health uh, they've been busy with this for about four or five years now where essentially what they test for is we all know the body has the indigenous uh, endocannabinoid system and in that system where you have anandamide and 2-AG that regulate the body through the CB1 and CB2 receptor and there's additional receptors in this uh, path chain, they've been assessing which genes are involved in modulation and regulation of the cascade effect of that interaction between CB1 and CB2 receptors along with all the different carrier enzymes. And in that process, what they're able to do is start developing the science about establishing how CBD, how CBN, how CBG, how THC, how different terpenes will interact within your body and elicit a certain response. And it's been well established that a lot of the entourage effect is affiliated to a lot of the terpenes as well, not just the cannabinoids in terming, determining that indica or that sativa type of effect. Uh, and this is the this is the type of science that we like to see because ultimately it's going to inform physicians, clinicians, and doctors about the medicinal roots uh, in terms of what right dosage is going to work for certain patients for certain indications. But as for general consumers, it's great to know you know what are the potential health benefits and potentially how DNA besides the methylation that can happen within the genes that affect it, but ultimately what all that science is going to tell us about health in the future. Today we're going to be talking about deep water culture, which is essentially a hydroponic method where you actually don't grow in a substrate or any media. You actually use what would be known as clay pellets or any other inert substance to keep the plant upright. Essentially, it's the root zone that you're targeting, where what you're doing is supplying nutrient-rich and aerated 
uh, solution or water to the product, um, to the actual roots itself. You may use beneficial microorganisms to help the uptake in the roots. Um, the key thing is the aeration and also keeping the pH balance going. Now, there's some clear benefits to deep water culture. Essentially, the ability to obviously do mass uh, hydroponic grows. So the ability, if you can just get the nutrient feed right and buffer the water appropriately, you can feed a whole array of um, trays and tanks. However, the downside is that you need the plants in the same level of vegetation, the same stage of growing, and if there's contamination, it's going to rapidly spread to all those root zones. So that's one of the benefits and drawbacks you'll see, but deep water culture is definitely an interesting one for hydroponic growers, so we wanted to mention it. Now so today's episode, we're going to be talking about some ethanol extraction equipment that's being commissioned in South Africa at the moment. Essentially, what we have is a large vessel where that stainless steel vessel will hold and retain your biomass. Into that biomass, we will inject a very cold stream of negative 40 degrees Celsius ethanol. The reason it's that cold is because it leaves the chlorophyll and waxes mostly behind when we're extracting. So in this cold mixture, it will basically focus on extracting the cannabinoids of interest. Those cannabinoids will then be pumped out of the system into a receivable tank. And from that receivable tank, we'll ultimately be taking that system onto the next stage of solvent recovery.